Welcome to the Seahawks Man to Man podcast, powered by Blue Wire. Shout out to the new company. My name is Michael Sean Dugar. You guys know where to follow me on whatever Elon Musk is calling that app these days at Mike Dugar, M I K E D U G A R. Appreciate all the love and support there. Shout out to everyone who's watching and listening on our YouTube channel, Seahawks Man, the number two man is the name of the channel. Thanks again for all of that love. We really, really, really appreciate it. All of our audio people right now, just press pause real quick. Shoot over to YouTube, press like, subscribe, and then just come on back. Even if you're not a YouTube person, that just really helps us out when you do that. Thank you, thank you, thank you in advance. Uh, Chris, go ahead and talk to him. What is going on, everybody? It's your boy, Christopher Kidd. You can follow me on Twitter at CKIDD206 and that's CKID206. All right. We've had a week of training camp, a week-ish, about, about four days, no pads, but... Very entertaining stuff. I mean, everything with Mike McDonald is just going to feel so we're learning so much each day. How does he handle this? What's what's this part? What does this player have to say about him? What does this player have to say on this side of the ball? How does Gino look? How does he coach him up? How does he coach the defense? Like, how's he using players differently, you know, or better, perhaps, is maybe the, the more important way to look at how he's using the players versus how the previous staff was. There's so much to see every day. So it's at four days – Feels like a good little stopping point. Say, hey, all right, cool. Let's talk about, you know, what we've seen. Uh, Chris, where, where where would you like to start? I know people have some questions that we'll get to at the end. Where would you like to start? I think we should start with the biggest news coming out of Seahawks training camp, and that is with Julian Love, as he is now signed his extension for three years, getting a little extra cheese to play pos- his safety position. And I think that's an important position for this Mike McDonald defense because they're going to be asked to do a lot. And he mentioned that in his presser. And I think we've talked about it last season. Julian had a rough start to the Seahawks season, but he slowly but surely got better week in and week out. By the end of the season, he was solid enough and earned himself a spot on the Pro Bowl. You can just argue and debate whether he earned it or not. But I know a lot of 12 listening, they don't care about that. They're excited that a Seahawk made it. So that's good on him in that regard. But we are going to be a little a little more, what's the word? We're going to look at it in a different lens. So I think we should definitely start off with Julian Love's new deal because he's going to be asked to do a lot in this defense. And is he up for it, Mike? Yeah, you know, I, well, the one thing he can do is a lot, which is, that sentence might be an oxymoron because <laughs> one thing and a lot. I, I got multiple numeric values in there. But that sentence makes sense, though, I promise, even though it just sounded funky when I said it. Like, Julian Love is, like, quintessential jack-of-all-trades guy, very similar to me, to Brad Bradley McDougal. I think Julian's probably a little better athlete than BMAC, but in terms of, like, asking them to do a little bit of everything, you I see the similarities there. You know, I'll never forget, basically, that – Chris, I don't know if you remember week two of the 2018 season, Bobby was hurt. KJ had just got the Reginekind thing. So he was hurt uh, and out this particular game. So their starting linebacker, I'm pretty sure was was uh, Michael Kendricks. And they basically asked, remember Shaquem Griffin had just got benched, uh, you know, from the Broncos game the week before. So they basically was like, B-Mac, can you play, basically play linebacker? It wasn't as simple as I'm making it, but it, they, Ken Norton was basically like, hey, man, can you play linebacker today against the uh. Bears? And B-Mac was essentially like, yeah, sure. You know, you can do whatever you ask me to do. They ended up losing that game, I'm pretty sure. They did. They lost that game. But defense played okay relative to the circumstances. Like, I think their starting corners were like Akeem King and Sha- Shaquille Griffin. Like, it was not – and no Bobby, no KJ. Doug Ball would also, I think, miss that game. It was just a, just a recipe for disaster, and they ended up, ended up losing. But anyway, I bring up that to say Julian – 
he reminds me of that. Like a guy who we've talked about this on the show as well. I don't think any of the safeties have like a superpower, like the thing they're super good at, like, like Quandre, we, his ball skills is like off, off the charts. And Jamal, as, it, as much as the drawbacks like Jamal had, like he was a very elite downhill player. Like I know everyone hates Jamal in Seattle pretty much, but whether you hate him or dislike him, like the film doesn't lie. Very elite coming downhill, whether it's top the run or whatever, play the flats, blitz, like he was just very good at, at that. That was his thing. Whereas the other guys they have now, Julian included, is like, all right, Julian's pretty good at this, pretty good coverage, pretty good zone, pretty good man, uh, decent tackler, you know, decent hands. I think he actually has good hands. Um, so just kind of just decent at pretty much everything. Rayshon Jenkins, I would I would say, is pretty similar. Kavon Wallace doesn't have the amount of snaps as those guys do in the league. I think uh, I think I was talking to Rayshon earlier this week. He told me, he's like, I've played over 100 NFL games. You know, I got experience. I said, over 100. Oh my God, that's just that sounds painful. Over a hundred. <laughs> oh my God, that's just violence, violence, violence. Um, but they're all kind of basically the same type of guy. So, and you're right, they are asked to do a lot. Uh, Julian's deal is worth up to thirty six million. Uh, that up to could be doing a lot of work there. I have not seen the structure of it quite yet. Uh, I actually just also haven't looked. But as that stands, that's like top ten ish safety money. You know, at three years, 36, which is not like that is a lot, you know, um, it, it's a lot in this context. Like you said, Julian kind of got off to a little bit of a rough start, played better towards the end of the year. But it's, you know, the word I've kind of gotten talking to people now that I've actually been back around the building is. One of the thoughts is Mike McDonald is basically just such a genius and so good at this that he can get people to play kind of above their heads, like someone that. Not above their heads. That's unfair. But take someone who hasn't had a certain type of year or hasn't produced in a certain type of way and then make them produce in that way. And the Ravens offered a ton of examples, particularly on defense, you know, like he basically resurfaced Clowney and Kyle Van Noy. And you had Manabuke who ended up getting a bag playing, you know, with Mike McDonald, uh, Ro- not Roquan, uh, Patrick Queen, you know, played the best he ever played in Ravens jersey while under Mike McDonald. Um, their other corner, Brandon, uh, it's either Stephens or Stevens, can't remember, but number 21 played his best ball over there on the Ravens. Uh, Kyle Hamilton obviously played his best ball. Um, but the guys like Geno Stones, you know, and Matt Abukes, even Brandon's like guys who were just like, they were, they were fine. And then with Mike McDonald, they were get paid. I mean, even Patrick Queen falls into this. Like Patrick was like, fine, go ask Ravens fans. He was like, fine for those first couple of years. And then like, Mike McDonald kind of really like unlocked him, so to speak, you know, so the Seahawks are hoping for that. They're hoping for, they're looking at their roster. They know they know all pros currently on it. Right. But they know they've, they're thinking Mike can take them there. You know, and Julian is one of those guys. They're feeling like he can, he can take them. He can take him there. Like he's already got that pro bowl caliber. I won't call it a ceiling, but like level he can get to. And now like, all right, with Mike, he can take guys, you know, Gino, I think led the league in interceptions last year, Stone, not Smith. Um, so it was like, he can, you know, take guys to that next level. The reason I say in the context of that being a lot for Ju- Julian, if I'm like, if I'm the Seahawks and I'm like, well, if I know our coach can do that, there's really never re- reason for me to pay anybody <laughs> at that case. Cause he can just keep, keep doing it. You know, it's very similar I feel like to what? Uh, While the Seahawks didn't really pay corners there, like they paid Sherm because, duh, but they weren't really, you know, they were willing to let like a DJ Reed walk. They were willing to let a Shaquille Griffin walk. They were willing to let a Byron Maxwell walk. Um, they did pay Jeremy Lane, but then read that pretty quick, you know. So th- because, and one of the thoughts was, well, Pete is so damn good at this. Like, just give me the next corner. And I'll make that guy playable. And that's that, it didn't totally bear itself out. But, Chris, I mean, I feel like all the best examples of Pete, of guys playing their best ball under Pete, like better than we would ever thought, is usually at the cornerback spot. It's like insert cornerback here played his best ball with the Seahawks, you know, uh, and Pete specifically. So I feel like if you're if you're viewing Mike McDonald as that guy for the entire defense, you know, you don't really got to pay anyone until they really like. All right, you're all pro 
tight. Like we're gonna have to pay you a bag to keep you, like they did with Matabuke. Like it was all pro, I think, and they had to go, they had to pay a bag to keep him. So it's good for Julian. I'm just kind of interesting. It's interesting to compare that thought process that I know they have. Like yo, Mike's gonna elevate all these dudes. Watch this. To that's tough. But let's pay him before he elevate him. I'm just like, oh, okay, yeah, I can. I can see both sides of it. We'll. we'll We'll, we'll see. Daisy is going to be asked to do a lot if, if with the salary, though, like we do with everybody else. You got to ball out. Ball out consistently. That's it. I would want to fill you in the big games. I would say, though, I would push back on the idea that you could just, you know, get a young guy or average guy and just, you know, have to pay him. Because I would say, wouldn't you want a cornerstone on your defense? For example, I know this might not work in this scenario because obviously Kyle Hamilton was the cornerstone, I think, with that Baltimore secondary. He was the number one guy. That is the dude that, if he's not him and there, Marlon Humphrey, I would say. And Mar- you would say Marlon? Marlon? Well, him and Marlon. Like Marlon's been there for a while. He's proven pro Bowl guy. That's true. I, I mean, Kyle's but only think, like year two or something. Two, like yeah. <laughs> So I, I, think I, I don't just, want to just act like Marlon don't exist. Like Marlon, that's I think true. Marlon might have been all pro before too. Uh, yeah, he has been. Yeah. So. Okay, that's a fair point. I just the uh, just the uh, the presence of Kyle Hamilton really just I I zoned in on him, especially because there's someone familiar in Seattle that's doing something similar, and that would be Spoon. But well, Mar- and Marlon was hurt last year too, so la- last year is probably why you know, key on Kyle versus Marlon. But fair in years point. past, Marlon made three Pro Bowls before last year. So yeah, so I won't. But the, I won't. The bigger point would be, don't you want that cornerstone defensive guy? So outside of Spoon, Mike, who would that be in the secondary, you think, if it's not Spoon? Who would be the cornerstone, your linchpin that, you know what, this is the guy that I think can take us to the next level. Regardless of, of in this situation, the floor and ceiling of his play. Uh, I would say I would say Reek. You, know, you would say I, Reek? I, ideally, yeah. I mean, Reek, Reek, Reek it, man... You want to talk about like ele- maximizing a guy or elevating? If you can get the best, the best version of what Reek can be is like an all-pro corner in my mind. Yep. Because he just has the things that you can't teach. You know, like him at- watching Reek and Trey Brown, who we'll get to a little bit later, uh, and we'll get to the whole cornerback room. But watching Reek and Trey Brown is so interesting because like Trey is so like he can really cover and recognize routes and get in position to make plays on the ball, but he's also like five ten, five nine. Whereas Reek don't yeah. even gotta be right all the time, and it's just like, well, I'm six four, and I and even if I'm wrong, I can catch up. I can run with whoever. Whereas Trey doesn't have that, and it's just like Trey has a lot of this stuff that, like, man, I think even Josh Snyder said it uh, on draft night with Trey Brown. He was like, if Trey Brown was six one, he'd have been a first round pick. And of course, you're gonna say that when you get him in the fourth round because it makes you the GM look like a genius, right? But the, yeah. the more I watch Trey Brown, I see why John thinks that because he's probably right. Because Trey has all of this stuff. He just, you know, Reek ran a 4-2 and was just 6-4. It's just not, you can't teach that. But, yeah, I would say you do got to have the guys. It's just you you don't always got to get, like, ahead of it before they play in your defense. Like, remember, they did the same thing last year with Chenna. I mean, they paid Chenna this time last year, no. um, it, it, regardless of the injury. But I could see why, like, okay, Chenna played really well in his first year with the Seahawks. Like, he was really good. And so this time they were like, hmm, we only have him under contract for another year. Let's get if he done. does if he does that again, we won't be able to afford him because of the way the edge rusher market goes. Like if Chenna like balled out and had like I think he had like nine and a half sacks. I have to check that or some he had something very close to ten in his first year. So they're thinking, okay, well he's probably going to eclipse that this year if he does. He's probably going to price himself out of Seattle because they just, you know, they only go so high for for certain guys. The, I'm sure they're thinking the same thing with Jay Love. It's like, hmm. But then to your gonna point, price though, himself out of here if he balls out again. To your point, though, the money that they're paying him, he's going to have to be a top ten safety, and that might be because I I see I think he's probably fifteen range, like he's middle middle of the league. I would argue. Let's let's go through the guys who are the highest paid. Let's see. Let's do it that way. <laughs> Shall we? that is the easiest uh, way to do it. Yeah, it's it. Well, there's there's guys who are on rookie deals who are balling, like a Kyle Hamilton, right? Who's not going to come yeah. up in any of the names I'm about to say. But yes, is it one way to do it for sure? Uh, Antoine Winfield Jr. Wow, he got 21 million a year. Holy hell! Uh, <laughs> good for him. No, he was really good last year. He was, I just, he was doing his thing. No, he did for real. Uh, he was everywhere. I must have just missed that. 
uh, Derwin James, Minka Fitzpatrick, Xavier crazy, McKinney. Though, the, the Chargers was terrible, and he still stood out. That's how good he yeah. is. <laughs> yeah, no, he's, he's, yeah, Derwin, Derwin's real deal. Minka's real deal. Xavier's – I think Xavier's just, like, good, you know, uh, but he got it. So there's back. one. All- so we'll, we'll, we'll put Xavier in there as one who left the Giants for – obvious reasons but yeah. okay cool so there's him well the reason yeah. that, that, that i, I uh, i've actually even watched xavier at all more than some of these other guys is because he played next to julian so when they signed julian i went back and watched the giants the giants yeah and i was like oh i'm watching i was essentially watching both of them um so yeah he's he's, he's good i think xavier's good jesse bates baller 16 yeah. million a year kyle duggar the guy john schneider thinks has the same name as me uh <laughs> called me Kyle Duggar like two times on that draft weekend, like as a joke. Right? And I was just like, bro, it's just Duggar, Duggar, Duggar. It's like, whatever. It was like the first time. And it was just like, John, like, yeah, come on. Uh, Buda Baker, 14 mil. Marcus Williams of the uh, Ravens, 14 mil. Jalen Thompson, go Cougs, 12 mil. So I think, and then uh, Grant Delpit of the Browns, 12 mil. Justin Reed of the Chiefs, 10 mil. So I think we're in – this is where – this is – these last few guys I just named are all like the salary range of Julian and, yeah. and the up to. I think I think it'd be fair to say if I'm them, I'd be like, hey, go be about as good as Jalen Thompson for the Cardinals. Uh, actually, go be better than that. Better, yeah. That, that's probably <laughs> fair. Well, I, well, I'm biased. I, you know, go Cougs. Jalen's, re- Jalen's really good to me. I think he – his versatility also allows Buda Baker to just be wherever the hell they need him. Like I think he he and Buddha play really well um, together. I think they're both going to be really good uh, for their their new coach. Forget his name, dude from the Eagles. But yeah, I think that's about a real real uh, reasonable standard. But the all, the other thing, last thing on Julian before I talk about this really great play that he made uh, the day he day his contract got finalized. I don't think the safety mark is probably moving much. Like with like with an outside linebacker, like with Chenna, I can see why you think hmm we should probably pay him now because if we don't. We're going to get a Frank Clark situation where he balls out and then we can't afford him. Uh, and we have to tag him, play that game, yada, yada, yada. The safety market, I don't think, is going to move in the same way. Like looking at some of the younger guys who may get paid, like it's not a t- Kyle Hamilton, obviously, is the name that stands out, but it's like, I, I don't think that, I don't think, yeah, you're looking at like if Julian, let's say Julian made it again, right, and was going to go to free agency. I don't think you're in a situation where you're like, he's probably going to reset the safety market. Maybe he could, I could be wrong. I could be reading that wrong, but we've seen the safety market get stagnant before. Earl was the highest paid safety, I think for like three or four years, like just because it, no one jumped him, you know, because no one was like, I'm we're just going to pay another safety. Pretty sure that was the, the case for quite some time. We saw the tight end market stall for a few years too. They all eventually moved, but like even the running back market stayed still for a little bit. So who knows? We'll see. We'll see. Good for Julian, but yeah, now the expectations are raised. Yeah, another interesting thing was that we we talked about it after the hire and we were waiting to see how many Baltimore Ravens players join Seattle because usually when your coach, defensive coordinator, coach for one team, goes to be a head coach for another team, what happens, Mike? You bring some of your boys with you because they know the mm-hmm. system, they can teach the other guys. So when Geno Stone, the safety, former safety for the Baltimore Ravens, signed a deal with the Bengals for two years, I think it was $12 million, I'm thinking, dang, does he not rock? Does he not like his... Does he not like him that much that he's like, it's okay. I'll, I'll go with Rayshon Jenkins for the same amount. If I'm not mistaken, they both signed this. So G- Gino's on a two year 14 Rayshon's on a two year 12, but to your point, yeah, they're very similar. I'm thinking, dang, you didn't want to bring him out here. So I, that, that was something that I thought about a lot over the past few weeks. I was thinking, damn. So what is, I'm not saying there's an issue there. Obviously he just went a different direction, but I thought Gino Stone was pretty, he was solid with the Baltimore Ravens. Hell, he picked off Geno Smith. <laughs> so, and <laughs> picked off everybody, man. I think he had a lot of so picks I, last year. That just made me wonder okay, I wonder how this is going to play out. You could have brought someone that is familiar with what you're doing, and he could have easily came to Seattle and taught everyone, Julian. Well, they'd probably be competing for that same spot, but you get my point, Mike. So, that was something that stood out to me is why didn't Geno Stone work in Seattle? Why couldn't that have happened? But assuming he would have even wanted to go, they could have offered him, and he just said no. You never know. Uh, who says no to Seattle, Mike? Uh, you say yes to the team offering two more the most money. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, that's it. That's, that's why I looked up the contracts while you were talking. I was like, eh, man, well, no, two man. million dollars difference, Chris. <laughs> hey, man. You know, it's the Bengals is offering 14 million. One team's offering 12. Well, well hey, you know, 14 bigger than 12. Sometimes that's 
that's all it takes. You remember when Chenna signed? They was like, you know, what drew him to Seattle? He was like, man, I was tired of paying them California tax state taxes. <laughs> It's like, hey, that'll do it, brother. Money, money does make a difference at times. You are right about mm-hmm. that. So I don't know if Maybe Ohio it, has a, a state income tax. I'd have to look that up. But it could be just that simple. Maybe I'm thinking too much into it, Mike. Thank you for no, you're right, though. That is something to wonder. You know, the Ravens just they 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 were willing to not pay some dudes, like they felt like Matabuke was worth re- returning, but not Patrick Queen, for instance. You know, so yeah. it was it, it was kind of Kind of interesting how that went. I want. I do want to mention this play that Julian made. That if I'm like, if he keeps doing that, oh, he's in for a big. Game. But see, I think up. that's. I think that would be the ceiling. They, but well, you, we haven't even discussed the play. I'm just jumping in as if everyone knows. Mike, explain the play. My apologies. <laughs> so what happened was it was actually really cool, like chess match. It's probably one of my favorite plays in camp, even though it's a bad play for the offense. So it was one of the. It was the final red zone play of Thursday's practice, whichever day Julian got paid. It was that day. Um, And it's third and let's call it four or five. And it's red zone. uh, Ones versus ones. And the Seahawks ran like a shell coverage too high. It looks like they're probably going to play four or two, maybe six. Who knows? Right. But then and so the the defense is lined up just completely normal. Nobody, you know, sometimes what we saw from the Ravens defense and from the Seahawks defense is on third downs. They would put the linebackers up like in both a gaps to look like, hey, we're coming or maybe we're not coming. It was none of that. It was just pretty much like, yo, this looks pretty like standard cut. Like we're about to just play coverage. And Gino sniffed out that that was a lie and like adjusted the protection. And I don't know if he changed the routes too, but you could tell him just moving stuff around. I don't know. I couldn't hear. But point is he saw what was up and he was right. They ended up sending the house. Mm. They had like full on engage eight. You know, I ain't played Madden in a minute, but I do remember that full on engage eight. And it was only like three routes, Tyler, DK, and I think Jackson. Everybody else stayed in the block. And Julian was playing like deep safety. And then, you know, it looked like Spoon would be covering Jackson. And then Spoon blitzes with everyone else. And Julian basically turns into basically playing off man, one-on-one coverage with Julian Love, or excuse me, with Jackson Smith and Jigba with no safety help, which is a terrible spot to be in for, you know, safety. And and J- uh, JSN ran like a little out route and boy, Julian broke on that bad boy, undercut it and snatched it away and just started turning up with the defense. I was like, that is a hell of a play. Chris, it reminded me of, do you remember the interception Deron Bland had against the Seahawks on an out route against Tyler Lockett? I think it was like third and seven, eight ish. It was, it was probably a, a very similar play. I won't call it the same play because they have a new offensive coordinator, but it was a variation of the same thing. Inside guy runs a you know a little uh, out route to the sticks. That's basically what Jackson ran. Julian saw it, broke on it, did the same thing Deron Bland did. It was like same same joint. The Deron Bland play was crazy, and the Julian Love play was crazy. And I remember thinking, you keep doing that, that type because that was that was elite. That wasn't like the ball bounces off bro's head in Cleveland and then you catch it. Like that's yeah, that's great. This was more like the play he made against the Eagles in the end zone, where it's like, no, I'm about to track this ball out 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 wrestle i think it was quez watkins for it. like that was just a great that was a great play that's real ball hawking what he did on thursday i was like okay he's yeah he, he can do that because that's a that's a tough call man you're 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 not in a position to cover jackson right like you're basically off man damn near on a blitz on a no safety help no no middle nothing and i was like oh boy you just could yeah, I hope the pass rush gets there, or you got to break on the play. And if he got double moved, it would be a touchdown. But there would have been no time because it was a blitz. So that's probably how he knew. Like, whenever he cuts, that's the route. So it was a great play. Uh, like, I can't film, and they didn't post it. I don't know why they didn't post that play. That was stupid. That play was great. Uh, but it was it was amazing, man. It was it was good. If Julian do more stuff like that, then yeah, maybe he will price himself out. He would have priced himself out of Seattle because that and was think- an all pro type play. That's what Mike McDonald's projecting, obviously, with this contract. The mm-hmm. Seahawks are projecting. They believe that he can take that next step because we have seen it. The fans have seen it. Now it's all about that C word, consistency. Can you do it week in and week out? There's a tackling. I'm not going to lie. Mike was being very nice because he has to see Julian in the locker room all the time. I could say this because I don't see Julian. It was atrocious. My boy was getting <laughs> – he was bouncing off dudes in the hole. I'm thinking, my golly, dude, just wrap up. And you got linebackers that can help clean it up. You ain't, I'm not saying you have to smack the dude, but if you can wrap him up, I'm okay with that. That's okay. You wrapped up. We get it. You're not the biggest guy. You're not a hammered type hitter. 
But there were times where he would just flat out miss. He would try to blast guys and bounce off of them. So tackling is something that I'm going to be paying attention to from the jump. How was he able to tackle? And in training camp, considering they will be padded up pretty soon, and also, Mike, you're going to see it even more when they go and scrimmage against the Tennessee Titans before their first season, first before their first regular season game, you're going to see a lot about this tackling and how good they can tackle. Because that's one thing that they've struggled with. Oh, you know, obviously, with Pete Carroll when they were running things, tackling was something that they just didn't do. All right, it wasn't the uh, the main attraction. They were well, saying it was. It's weird because remember Seahawks used to teach the whole world how to tackle. They had well, the hawk tackle, tackle, hawk but, tackle video. It was weird. But the thing is, in practice, they wouldn't. It was kind of I don't want to say frowned upon, but it wasn't something that they wanted. They wanted to keep guys up, and obviously yeah, you yeah, want yeah, to yeah, you yeah. want to keep guys healthy. Whereas Mike McDonald, it feels as if this dude's screw that hell. They have a joint practice, something Pete Carroll has never done for multiple reasons, right? So now I'm really interested to see the tackling, how this team's going to do it, because now it's a whole new scheme, whole new regime. Obviously, there are ways to tackle and be safe. And as you mentioned, they taught the league how to tackle. They were doing it one way, and that translated across the league in that regard. Rugby tackling, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so yeah, now take the head out of the tackle type thing, yeah. Bingo. So now with Mike, Mike McDonald, hey, I want guys tackling, all right? Bring them down. So Julian, I don't, for what it's worth, I don't know if he's gonna have people tackling in practice. I do we, know. yeah, we don't know, but it's. I wonder how Baltimore Ravens practices were. I guess we'd have to ask somebody that covered the team. Like, yo, what was it? What were the practices like with the pads on? I don't know if they did joint practices in Baltimore. They know they, they did. Had, okay. They had joint practices, yeah. Okay, so well, it'll pretty be, much everybody in the league was doing it. Pretty much, except for the Seahawks. Seahawks. <laughs> it was pretty much everybody, but. Pete Carroll, maybe there were some other teams, but I understood why Pete didn't do it because it's just so hard to control, you know, no, like, what the other it's team impossible. is going to do, you know, like you got dudes trying to make the team out there. They don't care about protecting your guys, no. got families to feed, you know, so got to gotta be careful. But we, yeah, we'll, we'll see. I, I like the idea of at least trying it once to see how the joint practices go, you know, but I've never really been a big fan of them uh, because – Man, you get that one dude who's like, this is my last chance in the NFL, boy. I ain't even passing this up, you know? Guy who just had a kid, he got the dad strength or something like that. He come over there, smack your $30 million receiver the wrong way. Yeah, you just, yeah, you never know. That it could, could end bad. You're right. Ways. Yeah, it, it could, man. It's just too much of a mix of guys who could, who like have no business really in that type of situation. Like if I, if I was in the, who just got, who's a receiver just got paid? Give me one. Doesn't really uh, I'm on raw. Yes. If the Lions do joint practices, I don't want no undrafted rookie DBs or linebackers around on Monroe St. Brown. If I'm if they go say they go scrimmage the Broncos. Boy, them Broncos, bottom of the roster dudes better stay away from my guys who are making all this bread. You know, which we just guaranteed. I gotta sell a lot of jerseys. Get this guy, you know. We ain't we we, we ain't doing that. So we'll we'll see. We'll get to uh, we'll get we'll we'll talk a lot about the joint practices as, as that gets closer. But yep. can we can, let's stay with the corners or DBs? Can we do DB that? Room? Yeah, because I want to talk about I want to gush about Spoon for a second because I can't really do it when I write my training camp observations because it's hard to explain that because he's not actually making a play because Chris he's not getting targeted out there. It is that really says every, that says oh, everything. Man. Man. He's got such good instincts. And, I mean, I don't want to say he necessarily – part of it is because you can hear him explaining his thought process sometimes. Like, for instance, he had a play against, uh, I want to say, Jackson Smith and Jigba, where he jumped – he played it a certain way that made Gino then have to adjust, but Gino and Jackson weren't on the same page with the adjustment. It didn't look like. So the ball ended up going out of bounds, I think, or just being incomplete. This was in the end zone. And you could hear Spoon being like, yeah, man, y'all get that back shoulder stuff out of here. I know what you're trying to do. You know, mm. and it's just like he he even when he doesn't announce that he knew what was coming, you can kind of see it. I remember there was a play. This was Thursday, I think. And they were running. It was I forget what it was, but I think it was third down and third or fourth down. They had to get to the sticks. And DK was like lined up in like I want to say like the slot, maybe you're just tight to the formation. He wasn't outside like he normally is. And yeah, you can run a slot fade with DK. Yeah, you can run like a seam with DK from the slot. But I fit my guess would be spoon figured. Well, if he's here, 
they're probably going to try to get him towards the sticks. So Spoon jumped on like a little quick thing, and Gino had to hold it, and he would have got sacked by Boye Mafe, I'm pretty sure, if you know if, if it was a live game. Or he would have thrown a pick six to Spoon. Either way, when it, there was been, there were no good outcomes left for the offense because Spoon was just like, oh, I'm on that. And like he was he was so on it that when Gino ended up tucking it and like running and the play got blown dead, Spoon was just jumping up and down, hollering, man, throw that, throw that, throw that. Like, dude, I'm on you, you know. And you just see so many of those different types of uh of plays where he spoons spoons screwing up stuff for the offense, you know, or just covering routes in ways that I've seen DBs not play as well, you know. Like he there was a there was a dig route that it's basically see, y'all remember the Rams game from the week one, pretty much every Rams game for the past like four years that's had Stafford in it, or the past every Rams game that's had Stafford, uh, you can apply this to. But do you guys remember week one? Remember they kept running a variation of the same damn route? Right, right behind in, the linebacker's ear. And in front of the safety, it kept running the same things, a little bunch of digs everywhere, right? And the Seahawks are running variations of that, as are most teams. Boy, Tyler Lockett must have just did some wiggle, hit this, hit the end breaker. Spoon was all over that, man. It was just, there's very few guys who have the wiggle to stay with Tyler out of his breaks, you know? I mean, you've been there, Chris, when you've seen, like, the one-on-ones. Tyler makes dudes look bad. Bad. Like, I've seen him make guys fall down, you know, one-on-ones with DBs when he's playing in the slot. He's a tough, tough cover. A little bit easier on the outside, but when he has those two-way goes, it's, it's, it's bad news. Like, I've seen him get guys cut. You know, like, I don't know why if that state got cut, but I'm pretty sure when they cut the dude, they'd be like, look, man, you can't cover 16. So have fun somewhere else, you know, mm. and Spoon was just just blanket blanket. And, Gino had to go somewhere else with the ball. You know, I think he just checked it down to Charbonnet on this particular play. Just like stuff like that. I'm like, yo, man, he's he's ready. And you notice, Chris, I just mentioned all their three best receivers. <laughs> And yeah. Spoon's able to cover it. That's all that of them. That says a lot. That's Jackson. That's DK. You know, not to say they don't, he don't ever give nothing up, but I haven't seen him really give nothing up uh, this in camp so far. Very few targets. Uh, forced a few, a bunch of incompletions. I've seen two on the first day guarding DK uh, to end practice. Like, he's he is on it. He he is really on it in coverage. We'll see how tackling and stuff goes. Not that I'm worried about Spoon tackling, but – telling you because he he is on it like the next day you come out oh man you'll see this guy he's on it man he just he he he's so smart you can see it as this is not new information remember pete carroll basically compared him to troy palomalu from an instinctual standpoint on draft night so we already know if pete's saying that pete don't just blow smoke i ain't heard him really mention troy that often so pete's saying that validated it but now even i'm starting to see it a little bit more because you know spoon had some injuries last training camp i want to feel like it wasn't out there a lot you know as often as he should have been right now I'm telling you he he's on it. deep stuff i remember there was a deep ball i think this might have been the first day uh another all-out blitz situation and this time jackson ran like a go and spoon was right there with him on his hip and he was so he was right there on him to the point where gino had to throw the ball to jackson's other shoulder you know because he threw it to the, his right shoulder spoon probably catches it he threw it the other way, and then Jackson couldn't locate the ball, got off the field on third down. Like, he's on it, and because I got to show some love to Trey Brown, because like I was just mentioning earlier, he does the right stuff. Like, he's there. There's just some physical limitations there with me and covering DK when you 5'9", five, 5'10", five, or whatever. That's just There's only so much you can do about that. But Chris, let me tell you, there was a three-play stretch. I want to say this was Friday. The three play stretch where they were in the red zone, and all three plays went to went at Trey Brown. First was like a fade ball uh, to Tyler Lockett, which the team did post a replay of that. I don't think it's a catch, uh, and they ruled it a catch at practice. Now looking back, that's not a catch, right? And Trey was right there, but that's more Tyler dropping it. But either way, so that's an incompletion. The next two plays, the next one was a, a goal line fade to DK, and you would think, well, goal line fade to DK, Trey Brown cash pretty sure didn't they connect with one when you came out they did it was on the yep. far end zone left side I saw as soon as you know let it go and i saw oh that's touchdown perfect placement nothing trey can do as you mentioned the height difference six four to five nine that's tough to do tough to guard someone that tall exactly they must have thought trey was like let's do it again this time trey was playing left cornerback um and it was like let's do it again nope 
trade all on him. And the thing about those those passes are, yeah, DK can get it at the highest point, but if he brings it anywhere near his body, Trey's really good at like poking upward with the you know, like playing through the hands. He's really good at that. Um, probably the best on the team at that particular uh, skill set, uh, which is crazy. I think he's probably even better at it than Reek. And Reek's arms are you know ten times longer, right? But he's just really good at it. So he broke that play up, and then the you could see DK and Trey arguing with each other. You know, after the play, walking back to the huddle, I'm sure DK was like you know, with more profanity than I'm about to use. Hey, Gino, man, give me that again. And they went right back at Trey again on three, three plays in a row. And this was more of like a, a, a fake, like an outbreaker, kind of like the touchdown Tyler had or almost had uh, in the red zone against the Bengals. And mm. what do you know? Trey Brown right there again, all over it, incomplete. They had to kick a field goal. Like, Three straight, that's three plays. Now, obviously, Tyler could have just caught the first one, but those two DK plays, back to back, like, no, nah, he's, he's on it. It's not like Trey hasn't given up anything, but that sequence really just, like, because I had talked to Trey, I think that morning when he told and he told me, he was like, I'm trying to be the best. I'm trying to be the best in the league. Pro Bowl, all pro, like, that's my goal. You know, I'm, I'm basically told me I'm him. It was, it was Trey Brown nicely doing the Kevin Durant. You know I am. Kevin Durant. Y'all know who I am. Like, he... Trey gave his version of that. He's like, I'm like that for real. And you go, you're going to see, you know, I'm going to be consistent and you're going to see. And yeah, he's, he's playing like it. It's some really good battles between the corners, man. Reeks, Reeks on it. And Chris, they're mismatch. They're mismatching them. Trey be on yeah. the left. Reek be on the left. Spoon be on the left. They all be on the right. Like Mike McDonald has decided these dudes can play and I will play them wherever against whoever. We this I could very easily see Mike McDonald shadowing these guys, like mm. you know, like hey Spoon, we're playing the Lions. You got you got fourteen. That's it. You got fourteen. Rock and roll. You know, like hey Reek, we're playing the playing the Niners. You got what's whatever Brandon Ayuk's number is. You got I think it's eleven. You got eleven. That's you all day. Let's roll or whoever else. You know, I'm excited for that because what I so far it looks like they're man. All three of them dudes can cover. Like, it ain't perfect. Yeah, they ain't a bunch of sherms out there, but in their own way, like, you could tell they can cover. That bodes well for the defense because you could argue that Tyler Lockett, JSN, and DK are top five trio in the league offensively. Those three guys. Probably higher than that. Top three. So however you want to rank it, they're in that discussion. And when you have Mike, who is at practice every day, at training camp watching these guys battle and there are so many chances where so many times there are the defense is winning and Trey Bound is being effective. Spoon is dominating and saying, basically, you cannot throw on this side. You cannot throw to this receiver. And then you have Reek who shows who is showing consistency and getting back to his rookie year form where he knows the game. He knows the coverages. He knows where he's supposed to be. And he's making plays on the football that is a great sign for this defense. Now, obviously, it's going to be imperative to have a good pass rush as well because those two need to work hand in hand. The, men, the one thing that made the Baltimore Ravens defense so good was the fact that, A, they were getting good pressure, and B, the corners and safeties were playing great defense. There, there wasn't a lot of open lanes. So there's good pressure, and then when the ball is thrown, you have guys in the secondary that can make plays. And if the Seahawks can... Mirror that having a good pass rush with Chenna Nuosu, Derek Hall taking the next step. Obviously, Boye Mafe ascending his game and having a strong start and finish. Then, my goodness, this defense could be really talented. And now Mike McDonald is the savior for the Seahawks. Or actually, no, may not the savior, but the Seahawks are looking better than they have been in the past previous seasons. And they're back to being a dominant defense. And that is what you want to see and hear as a fan. So that is positive signs. That is a good thing to hear that Trey Brown is stepping up to the challenge and he's not backing down because that's that I've, from watching him since he's been drafted, obviously his knee injury put him back a year, but outside of that, he's always been a dog. I think, man, I want to say, I wonder who we had on a few years back talking about Trey Brown's game. Maybe it was Nick Baumgartner. I'm not even sure, but I'm, I, I remember we had someone on and they basically described him as he is, going to give it everything he has, and he's not backing down from no one. And Mike just alluded to that with him going up against DK and Gino basically, Gino and DK saying, yeah, we're going to try him again. 
and he still is able to make a play. That's just great. That's what you want out of this defense. And I think it's going to bode well for this team. I really do. And Julian Love plays out of his mind. Rayshon Jenkins finds a good role. Secondary might be a real problem in Seattle. And then you combine it with the pass rush. Leonard Williams, Byron Murphy, Draymond Jones. He finds some consistency. I mentioned Boye Mafe and Yuchenu Osu in the linebacking core. Figure that out. Wow. This defense might be able to do something scary and surprise a lot of people. I know last week, Mike, someone asked a question of the ceiling and the floor. And the floor was, I think you said four wins or something. But the ceiling was, I think you mentioned 12 wins. If everything goes according to plan defensively, and obviously the offense is average, then yeah, this could be a 12-win team for sure. Yeah, I'm I'm not that high on the ceiling, man. I'd say maybe like 10, 11. Hang on, didn't you but say 12 last week? I don't know if I said 12. If I did, I'm sorry. I don't feel that high. But I, I do feel <laughs> there are some things that could break really well. I'm much higher on the cornerback room than I am, I think, pretty much every other position group on defense just because I've seen it. I see it in each in all three guys, and, I, and I'm not, like, projecting. You know, I, I've actually seen it on the field. Like you said, Trey, when he's played and been healthy, has been fine. You know, like, we've not I – ain't, I ain't watched Trey Brown play, and I'm like, yeah, they probably should draft a corner. You know, like, I haven't really seen that, you know. Same thing with, like, we've seen Reek tie for the league leading interceptions and play really well. Um I don't have to project on that. And then Spoon, obviously, is a baller. Whereas, like you mentioned with the some of the other guys, it's it's some projecting there. It's like projecting for, for J-Love a little bit. Uh, certainly projecting well. for Rayshon, yeah, yeah. And projecting with uh, projecting with D-Hall, DT. Well, not as much DT. DT has produced. Um, but projecting with D-Hall for sure. I'm, I'm pretty high on Boye. I'm high on Boye and Chenna for sure. Like, I was watching... I was gonna tweet it, but I don't have like the two hundred or however many characters, you know, to make one of the long tweets. So I just mm. decided not to and save it for here. But I was watching the O line, the uh, offense, uh, excuse me, the outside linebacker room the other day. I was like, you know, I can see the vision. I don't know if it'll work out, but I can see the vision of just like this is a potentially really good group of rushers. Like just looking at them as rushers, I was kind of ignoring run defense just for a second, just like. I really like Chenna's game. Chenna's really, really, really good. He can win multiple ways. Like he, he really, really, really can. Uh, and he's just got the wiggle to like bend around people. I got the hips to do whatever, the strength to do whatever. And it just feels like that's the you. That's the piece. Everyone else is good too. Like boy, his like rip move that he do was like just destroying tackles last year. He was hitting everybody with, it and it was great. Like. He's obviously really good. And then he kind of slowed down later in the season. And like, but you know, D Hall's thing is probably going to be his power. DT's thing is probably going to be his speed. Was like, when I look at Chen, I'm like, all right, man, I think you can do everything. I don't, I'm not saying he's like Miles Garrett or nothing necessarily, but like he, he can win however he needs to win. Like whatever the tackles vulnerability may be, I feel like he can do it. I don't know if that's translate to a double digit sack season per se, but if he gets to that, I feel like it's going to help everybody else too. Like I could just, I could see it. I'm also high in the interior room, but I'm projecting a little bit more there, particularly with Byron Murphy. Cause I ain't seen him play, you know, in the NFL. I'm high on D I'm high on Jay Reed and Leonard, but you need, they ain't, they ain't on the field every snap. Whereas with the corners, I'm much higher because I'm like, Oh, spoon and Reek don't need to come off the field, you know, and Trey Brown only does when they're in base. Right. So I'm much higher on that group, but I could kind of see the vision. The only thing, Chris, I'm a little skeptical about is the Draymond Jones at outside backer thing. I just feel like it's it's trying to we're we're getting into like Kobe Bryant territory. There, we're just like we're trying to move you around. It's just like, man, I feel like we just focused you on this thing you've already proven you're good at, which is playing defensive tackle. You know, which is why you got fifty million dollars. Just do the thing. You know, I didn't. He's kind of like a tweener. It, which I can see why you would maybe push him one way or the other, but I would have probably pushed him to like bulk up, get to maybe 290 or something, and then like, all right, you're, you're defensive tackle, as opposed to it looks like he's dropped to about around 265, and it's like, yeah, I'm an outside backer now, which is fine. I'm not as high on that. That's a projection. We'll see. Hopefully he's better. It, it, he's more comfortable in that role than looks like last year. It just wasn't as comfortable. Uh, 
but I see the vision. I was looking at the group the other day and I was like, man, I see what John's doing. Like sometimes I just don't see it. Like currently with like linebacker, right? I'm just like, I don't see it. I don't see it. For the same amount of money, I feel like you could have just kept the guys he had, but whatever. He didn't do it. No point of dwelling on it. But like sometimes you got, I mean, you guys all know too. You'll you'll see Josh Stein do something. You're just like, well, that's stupid. Why are we doing that? You know, like whether it's the old line or tight end room or something, just like, well, no, that's not a good idea. Whereas with like cornerback, cornerback room is currently constructed. I'm like, yeah, I see it. I see, or excuse me, the outside linebacker room. I'm like, okay, I, I at least see the plan. It could blow up, but I do, I do see the plan at least. So hopefully that I'm, I, yeah, if I said 12 wins on the other pod, I'm sorry, y'all. I lied. I don't think the ceiling's that high. Okay. Now I might be tripping. Maybe Mike said 10 wins. So I added two. Yeah. It, it's, I know Mike said double digit wins. I will say that. Cause I think 12 will win you the division. And I don't think they'll do that quite yet. Um, but I think they'll be feisty. I think they could be like a feisty, feisty wild card team. I I, I could see that uh, because, like you said, there's some there's an optimistic version where the defense is just nails, just like the Ravens. We'll see. I don't think it'll be nails in that way, but I see the most. Uh, I'm starting to see more of the like division with it. Again, well, outside the linebacker thing, I don't know what's going on there. I will end it with this, Mike. How many all pro players do you know off top? Maybe you know this answer. How many all pro players did the Baltimore Ravens have last year? Okay, let me see. On defense or just on the whole team? It's just my apologies. On defense. Excuse me. Let's on, let's on defense. Yes. Uh Justin Matabuke, uh, uh Patrick no, what's the linebacker? Roquan, Roquan mm-hmm. uh Smith. There it is. Roquan, Matabuke, and Kyle Hamilton, I would say. So one guy at each level of the defense. So if, if I'm not, so if I'm not mistaken, it was actually only two, only mm-hmm. two players. Oh, oh Matabuke wasn't all pro. I do not think he was all pro. I think it oh, was damn. just it was Roquan and Kyle. If I'm not mistaken, let me double check for you. Yeah, Matabuke was he made the Pro Bowl, but Roquan and Kyle were the only two that made all pro. Oh, he was second team. Matt Bouquet was second team. That's what I first was team. Sorry, yes. Yeah, it's, it's right. okay. First team. Yeah, no. I, I I feel like I seen his name on the voting. I was like, my bad. Minute. He was second. Two team. mistakes by me. <laughs> Quiz. Yeah, are we talking about the offense or the whole team? No, just the defense and first team All Pro. It was just those two guys, Kyle Hamilton and Patrick Queen. No, 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 no Roquan. Roquan, yeah. excuse me. So, so you say that they could have some All Pros on this team this year? Well, I think Spoon is our. I think everyone would agree Spoon could definitely be all pro for sure. And then the second one that is up for grabs. I honestly, you can make the case that Reek makes the jump back to his rookie season type play. Corner's you, tough. It's to no, it, it, you saw what happened with him this first year. <laughs> and yeah, then, it's a that's tough spot. I don't know about the D-line. Leonard Williams, I think he can be a pro, but I don't know about all pro. Uh, Uchenna, we talked about it before. That's just really hard just because of all the edge rushers and his position. It's, But the, the, the thing that I said was he's really good and stuff in the run, so that might edge him out. But even then, you're going to have to have 10 sacks, a bunch of splash plays. He's going to need like 20 sacks, bro. Like It's just hard to get... Think about it this way: for the this is how tough it is to make All Pro first team at least as as an outside backer. Max Crosby's never done. When he's a monster, and Max, and Max Crosby, yes, is a freaking monster. He's a, he's been second team a couple times, but like never been first team. And he's a beast. He is a monster, and, and he and because he of Miles Garrett and stuff, he just can't make it. Yeah, thirteen sacks last season. How much is, or sixteen? Maybe more. He was a monster. He plays every snap. He had fourteen and a half last year. Fourteen and a half. Okay, so yeah, so Utena would have to get sixteen sacks, twenty tackles for loss, something crazy like that. A couple of forced fumbles, which is crazy. Like when you think about it, but if he plays a full season, obviously that's that's the type of impact I think Utena can have. But that's kind of what's been floating on my head. Look at that Ravens defense. Okay, they had two guys, first team All Pro. Can the Seahawks, can they, they got one for sure in Spoon, I think we can all agree on. Now, who is that second guy? So that's something to think about, especially for Seahawks fans to wonder, okay, well, what's this defense going to shape up to look like? 
could a D lineman have a flash season and become a pro bowler, like a really good pro bowler, like have a really good season and earn that. So that's something to look forward to, but we've talked also, enough. Patrick Queen was a uh, second team all pro as well. So they had a couple guys, first team and a couple guys, second team on defense. True. So they had some guys, they had some guys, uh, they really, really pop. I don't know how that's, the, it's just tough to make it at those spots, but we'll, we'll see. I think, I think maybe, I think Spoon and maybe Big Cat. Maybe. That's a maybe. He would need double digit sacks for that. Which is he not would. impossible. It's just hard. It's just hard to do that. <laughs> Very hard. But we got some Twitter questions to get to, Mike. You ready for those, man? We got quite a few. Uh, Yeah, let's do it. All right. So. Who was the who's your friend from France that sent out the question? Did you get his name by any chance? Uh, let's see. I did get a DM. Uh, Louis Saudi. All right, Louis. Louis is curious, Mike. Now that the team brought back Marquise Blair, what does it mean for the safety nickel position group? Good or bad news? Congrats also on the wedding. Thank you, Louis. Uh, maybe that's Luis. Louis? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, Marquise Blair. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm happy for him. Uh, I'm just happy he gets another shot. I don't uh, and I'm going to be a super Debbie Downer. I don't I'd be kind of surprised if he cracks the rotation just because it's tough. They got Kobe. He'd basically have to be outplay Kobe, maybe because they've they've got like their top three already with Kavon, uh, J Love and then Rayshon. And you have Kobe, who I doubt they're gonna cut right so i don't and i don't see them carrying five safeties because they know they got jarek reed coming back from the 20 acl at some point um so it, it'd be tricky i don't see him playing nickel like he could but he's probably better uh at safety i'm just really happy against the op i just want to see him smack some people in the preseason not gonna be not gonna lie to you um that's really what i'm looking forward to because chris and i were in miami i want to say oh, when he yeah. smacked that dude in the broncos and like, we had to end up seeing the video later oh man i wish i was there uh, for that, that was a hit. His first year, uh, his first preseason game, monster of a hit. Probably the strongest hitter I've ever seen, um, like live. That is it, Cam Chancellor, like at the DB spot. He might even be a stronger hitter than Spoon. And Spoon's out here suplexing cats, and that's saying a lot. Like Marquise is like legit, legit strong. Uh, it's crazy because he's not super big, but uh, yeah, I'm happy he's getting the second shot. Although, but we have seen. These guys get the second shot and it just doesn't stick. You know, Brandon Browner came back for a second shot. Sean Shea came back for a second shot. Luke Wilson came back for a second shot. I think just recently they re-signed Paul Richardson. What was that like two, three years ago? He got his like second chance back with the team. Uh, so there's no like guarantee when they do this reunion thing. Sometimes it sticks. Right? But even like Joey Hunt just had to stick around on like the practice squad and he came back. So, it's, you know, it's there's no guarantee. Sometimes it's just fun just to see the guy back. See him get a shot with Marquise. He just got hurt right when he was like really gonna start cooking, I think, which was really unfortunate. Uh, but I'm happy for him. I really am happy for him. I hope it's I hope it sticks. They're just kind of the safety room getting kind of jam-packed a little bit when they keep paying guys. So um we'll see. If Jarek Reed's uh knee injury recovery lingers, though, I could see Marquise like leapfrogging some of the other guys they have back there and perhaps being there like sticking around on the practice squad or something like that, getting elevated in the case of injury, you know, things of that sort. We got one from Kimwell Santana at Santana Speed. Shout out to Kimwell for giving me a brutal Saturday morning workout on the track. Appreciate you, my G. He wants to know, similar to what the Hawks did with Love Extension, expecting a big year and paying him now before his market blows up. Would you do the same with Gino and extend him now so you don't have to pay him 50 M's per year? Uh, No, I would not do that. Um. Nor do I think Gino should agree to that, by the way. Like, if, if they even present, if they came to Gino and was like, there's 50 million, like, per year right now, Gino should say no. You know, bet on yourself, brother. Because if you think you're going to ball, go ahead, uh, ball out and get 60 million or whatever. But I do think that the reason I say no to that is because, very similar to my line of thinking with, Lo with Julian Love, uh, not as much with the market staying still. My logic there is more like, I just think that whatever version of this player you're going to get this season, you're, he's not going to price himself out because he's not going to – guys price themselves out when they need to go to the top of the market, I feel like, which is what we saw from Frank Clark. Like Frank, I think the guy who priced him, priced Frank out of Seattle was essentially Demarcus Lawrence, I, I believe. 
I have to double check these numbers, but I think like DeMarcus got at the time, like $21 million a year from the Cowboys, like a five year, 105, I think from the Cowboys or something, or whatever five times 21 is or whatever. It was that. And the Seahawks saw that and was like, well, that's like top of the market money. I think that might've made him the highest paid pass rusher in the league at the time. Like, we were like, we're not doing that for Frank. And yeah, you do worry about that. If you think some way you don't want to pay someone top of the market. Right. But I think even if Gino just like balls out, has another pro bowl year, I don't think you're looking at like Gino having to get what is the highest paid right now? 55 million. I think I love and I think Trevor Lawrence at 55 as well. Uh, so I think Tua is right under that, like 53. I just don't think that whatever version of Gino you get is going to demand that, like in a contract negotiation, largely because of the age. I just think that Gino is going to at that point, let's say he balls out, you know, then you're he's 34. I don't think he's going to the table at 34 and being like, all right, guys, I need this $55 million bag, you know? And at that point, Dak and Brock Purdy have probably gotten paid. So the new highest paid might look like 57 or something. I don't think Gino's going to like, yo, I need at least 55, you know, 52. He could, but I just, I feel like all of those people have those cases in these contracts largely because of age, you know, Julian loves getting this, not just because, they think he's right now the best quarterback in the league. It's because what is Julian Love even old enough to drink? Like, how old is this guy? Twenty five. Like, yeah, is it? Uh, I think I said Julian Love. I meant Jordan Love. But uh, is Jordan Love? Oh, Jordan Love. My apologies. He's twenty four. Jordan Love is twenty five. Turns twenty six in oh, November. I was so, like, right. okay. that's why these guys are getting paid. It's it's a projection, you know. Like they're paying Trevor Lawrence because they know like how real Trevor Lawrence is. You know, by the time he gets to the end of his contract, he might be 30. You know, like same thing with Tua, same thing with uh even how old is Jared Goff? I feel like Jared Goff ain't even that old. I, I wouldn't have uh Jared Goff is 29, turns 30 on Oct- in October. So Jared is a little different, but even then, by the end of his deal, I don't even think he'll be as old as Gino is now, right? So huh. That all that puts his age in per, into perspective as well. So you don't really have Gino doesn't have that same negotiating power as some of these younger dudes. Is I guess the gist of what I'm saying. Even Dak, you know, I don't know why the Cowboys haven't paid him quite yet, uh, but Dak is only 30, right? Or he turns 30 right now, today. Uh, the day you guys are hearing this pod come out is be Dak's birthday. Happy birthday, Dak! Uh, so uh, he just turned, or just, I think he's just turned 31 or whatever. But you guys get the point. So uh, he. He's a little different, uh, but even then, if you give him a three-year deal, like by the time his deal is up, he'll be as old as Gino is right now. So you get all these guys, like age is working in their favor, I think, um, with this reason getting paid. So I don't think you were, you have to worry about like like you did with Russ because Russ had gotten top of the market extensions twice. Like Russ got the 140, which I think made him the highest paid, and he got that first deal in 2015 that I think made him the second highest paid behind Aaron Rodgers. So what they were thinking there, like, uh, we're going to have to keep resetting the market with Russ. You know, if you're, I don't think you have to worry about that with Gino. I feel like even if he balls again and plays as well as I think he's going to play, because, boy, let me tell you guys right here, Gino is spinning that thing in practice. The DBs are making him work, as we just talked about, but he is spinning it. Like, sometimes, you know, it's not always a completion because, you know, corners get paid too, safeties get paid, whatever, pass rush. But that brother is spinning it. like. He is. It's very clear. There should be no quarterback controversy. I don't even want anybody to ask me that ever again. <laughs> Sam Sam Howell is like rough out there. Pretty bad. Like really, really, really bad. But Gino spinning it. Like really, I was listening to a Ryan Grubb interview. He was called, he said, Gino, accuracy, the way it comes off his arm, like just absolutely just nails. You know? And yeah, I'm seeing the same thing when I watch him. But no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to Gino right now and say here's fifty two million dollars a year or whatever. Cause I just don't feel like you're going to have to worry about that. Just like when he just got paid, you didn't have to reset the market. Gino, the max on his new deal is what? 35 million a year or something like that's, that's chump change quarterback money. And it was at the time. So it barely paid him like a top 10 quarterback with incentives. So I don't think that you have to worry about getting him to like 50 plus now, maybe like 40 plus, but if you got to, if you're getting Gino Smith, after he balls out again at 40 plus, that's a steal too. Because as we just seen, there's like eight guys making 50 mil right now, you know, and there's going to be two more with, with Brock and, and Dak. So, uh, and I could be forgetting someone else 
who, who maybe do the re up. So, no, I, I, I don't think you got to do that. Gino's not going to price himself out of Seattle, I don't think. Speaking of the young guy, Sam, what are your thoughts on Sam struggling? This is from DK underscore Wookie. Throwing and or footwork changes due to improvements by a QB coach, offensive coordinator, still getting used to the scheme and wide receivers. What's going on there? Or should the Seahawks start looking for someone else at quarterback in the future as well? Yeah, uh, like I said, Sam's looked pretty rough. Um, the thing about Sam is, and I, I've I told some people this as I was uh, working on this project I just did, and it involved me watching some old Russ games. The more I watched old Russ games and the more I know about quarterback play and then the more I watch like Sam Howell and some other smaller quarterbacks that I've seen live now, I, Chris, have de- I've become like I'm not drafting a quarterback under 6'2 guy. Like that, I'd be that GM. It'd just be a hard no. The only I would only make exceptions if he is like a phenomenal athlete, like Kyler Murray. Like Kyler Murray is like a slot receiver with a hose. It's just nuts. And I don't know how tall Kyler is, but I, he's not very tall. He's probably the only exception in the, this recent batch of these short guys. But I, I'm not touching a short guy. And I think I said to say I think that's probably the the genesis. Without me being a QB coach, I would point to that as the thing. It's like I just don't know if he can see. I just don't like he's. He is. He tried to throw a back shoulder the other day, and it landed like five yards out of bounds. Like it was, I, I just couldn't believe. It. I, th- I was like, "Am I the only person who saw this?" And then I was talking to, uh, oh, uh, Greg Bell, ex Greg Bell, about the back shoulder throw that Sam Howell tried to make. It was just awful. Uh, it was to the point that I'm pretty sure the coaching staff probably, or Sam maybe just looked at the film and was just like, "Sam, you got, you got to at least put this ball near our guys." Like, you're just not even putting it near them. We can't even evaluate our receivers because the ball is not near them. No, I'm serious. Like, it was that bad. Uh, and then he was much better on Saturday. You know, still bad. You know, he threw an interception right to Lance Wiggins, right in the end zone. Uh, Lance dropped it, but still, it was just an awful pass. Got picked off by Kevon Wallace, too, in the end zone. Uh, just, just bad stuff. But he was better putting it near his guys. Like, Bobo went up and got some stuff. Cody White went up and made some touchdowns. You know, went up and got some stuff. Esau Winston had his best day on Saturday, just just cooking guys uh, on Saturday. Esau was locked in. So you could tell that some they got to Sam somehow because even some of the passes that I'm talking about, these guys caught, they weren't great. Like the Esau one, he had like one hand in the back of the end zone. Like it was crazy. Uh, but just put it near the guys. Like for three days, Sam wasn't even putting it near the guys. It was just like, this is, this is bad. This is like really bad. Uh, so I, I, I would probably assign it to height. I'm just, yeah, I, I'm like a height. Is it like a, you know how there's like racist, sexist, whatever, like whatever the one for height. I'm that heightest, heightest heightest or whatever. I'm just not, I'm not touching these short guys. No bakers, no Sam's, no, uh, who else is short? Who's the, uh, there's a short guy that just got drafted. Oh, Bryce Young. Oh, Bryce Young. Yeah. 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 No, not touching that. I would have taken CJ Stroud over him. And if they, they asked me why I'd have been like, cause he's taller. And that's it. That would be my only, I'd be like everything else to probably equal CJ's taller. That's easy. Like, that and I would feel good about it. I'd have been dead serious too. I'd have been like, yep, he can see over the old line every play. I'm never gonna have to worry about it. That's it. And I because I really think that's it. Like Sam, there's a there's a play that really illustrated this. I don't know if this was a height thing, but it was interesting. And if Chris, if you run into Hugh Millen, he'll remember this play too on KGR. Uh we, me and Hugh both saw the same thing. They were running, I would guess, probably four verts or something, and Bobo was going up the slot. Butt naked open, still a phrase from Chris, just butt booty naked open. Hand up type of like, yo, it looked very similar to uh, Colby Parkinson's touchdown against the Broncos uh, in the week one opener a couple years ago. Looked just like that. And But Sam doesn't see him. And instead, Sam just lofts a go ball to like, I think, Chenault or something in the back of the end zone. Like he's covered and everything. And the guy catches it. I think it might have been Cody White. Either way, great catch by the receiver but it was it like i remember hugh walked by me and he was like man even when he makes the even when he throws a touchdown it's the wrong read and then like you know that's got those screens that show the replays of the plays on the field and me we and hugh both looked at it and we both see jake bobo hand up wide open and I, we were both like yeah that was probably the read <laughs> and he he went for the ball that i'm sure he could probably see better the deeper one, you know, instead of the one kind of over the middle. So that was for me, that, that play is going to stick in my brain until he makes a better one. That's just like, yeah, he's that's even on a touchdown. You make the wrong read. That's tough. I mean, Jake was just so wide open. It was one of those plays like 
everyone would probably screenshot if it happened in a game, be like, why didn't Jake get the ball, you know, and post it all over Twitter <laughs> or X, whatever that's, that app is called now. So, yeah, nah, Sam ain't looking great. We'll see. I want to see him in some preseason games first, though, before I'm like, just elevate PJ Walker. I'm going to hold off on that until I see him in some preseason games. We got one from Chihuahua Glory. What do you think Jake Bobo's role will be within the offense this season and the upcoming years? Could he be league average starter eventually? I don't think not in this offense. Too much firepower. There's just too, there's just too many other guys who need the ball. There's only one ball. And we've just kind of seen that bear itself out. And we've seen like guys we felt were getting underutilized. I've never really heard. I went back and listened to a lot of Pete Kill press conferences going back to 2010. It's very rare that he's just like, yeah, we're just not using our guys right. I just never really heard him say that. And he said that last year, I think twice. I think, he's, I think he said it once about Jackson after the Thanksgiving loss, I want to say. And then he said it again about the tight ends, I want to say. And I'm just like, wow, you're just throwing Shane into this bus. And then you're just backing the bus up over his over his brain and then running him back over again. Uh, and I just really didn't hear, hear him say that. And I, and I bring up the underutilization is just because there really is just only one ball. Even on the really good offenses, some guy is just not going to get the rock. You know, I was thinking about that at practice the other day, too. I was just like, somebody's going to feel like they can go ball out somewhere else, whether it's Tyler, whether it's Jackson, whether it's uh, Jake, maybe Noah. It's just like these guys, there's just so many ballers on the team. And unfortunately for Jake, that just means like getting you can't get the ball enough to K-9, Noah, DK, Jackson, and Tyler, and then still have room to feed Bobo. You just can't do that. There's only one ball. So, unfortunately, I think that Jake's probably in for another season where he catches maybe a touchdown or two, maybe a couple hundred yards, but is not, you know, like you ain't picking up in fantasy. You know what I mean? I think I had him one week. Uh, I think I lost that week. So, yeah, he got a touchdown that week, though. I think DK was out. Jake's going to be the perfect type of guy for a situation like they had against Arizona. Somebody's hurt. Jake steps up. But when everybody healthy, just got other guys, who, other mouths to feed. This one is from at Rosebug underscore 22. Chris Leeper, what are you most looking forward to to seeing in the preseason? Oh, that's easy. Violence. I really want to see some people hit some people, man. I, I, I've, I've just come to... I've come to accept that that is the thing I enjoy most about football is just like the violence. It's all, I have empathy for it too. Like watching this receiver stuff on Netflix, you just see what these guys got to go through. And even not seeing what they go through, like with George Kittle, whatever they did to his shoulder, whatever episode that was, it was so bad they couldn't show us. And that's saying a lot because they were showing us a lot of things uh, in terms of guys' recovery. And they were just like, we can't even show you what we're about to do to George's shoulder to get him in the Super Bowl. Just close that door and that's it. So uh, the, the violence. Yeah, I really want to see uh, – I don't want to see any of the starters out there for what it's worth, but I just want to see some guys hit. Because really I understand now why coaches, like, never really want to praise guys too much until the pads come on because that is just such a big part of it. And it's not even just like, oh, the play doesn't end until someone gets tackled. It's more of like the, the end of game stuff. Like you're rotating during, you know, uh, practice, so you're not on the field the whole time. It's like, I want to see in the fourth quarter who's still running and hitting. Who's still getting off the rock? Who's still moving, guys? You know, that's what I want to see, and I just can't wait. Now, I granted, guys don't play the whole game in the preseason, but I just want to see it. I want to see D. Hall running over tackles. I want to see uh, Julian Love hitting people. Like, remember that guy he hit on the Titans on the flea flicker? God. Smoked that guy. I don't remember Chris Moore, was it? I think it was Let's Chris go Moore. with that. No one will know if we're wrong. Um, I guess they will now. Damn it. But <laughs> let's just let's pretend this is Chris Moore. Let's just he just smoked this guy. You know, I want to see that. I want to see more of, uh, of that, you know. Um, so I'm as you can tell, I'm really excited to see defense. I don't really care what the offense does too much. Um, but I want to see some defensive coordinator Ryan Grubb, how he dials things up. I'm really curious to see third down what they do on those scenarios. Obviously, it won't be a lot of the first team to Mike's point. I really don't want to see the starters out there too much just because... The, with it that, could be, though. Too. We, we don't know. Considering don't know. everything's new, I would guess they're probably going to play a little bit more than we would mm -hmm. expect them to just because, hey, it's a new thing. Everyone's learning. So get the kinks out now and cross your fingers and hope that everybody can make it out healthy. 
But I'm looking forward to seeing the offense, third down especially. And then defensively, how how they disguise things. I've seen a, a little bit of it when I did go to training camp on the second day of practice. I got to see a little bit of things, saw our rotation, saw safeties playing high, dropping low. I did see a little bit of that. So now watching the preseason, I'm going to be looking more for that and seeing, okay, will they have a three safety look where they just drop three safeties and have three deep on a scenario where we went, okay, what is this, what is what is going on here? I know they're not playing three deep because when the play is snapped, who's going to rotate down? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do what? Who's blitzing? So that's what I'm looking for. Offense and defense schematically is how this team is plans on doing things for me. Let's see. We have one from Axel MTG. What are you noticing about the chemistry between players and coaches where relationships seem to be growing and it could be player to player or player to coach. And then have you seen them practicing the new kickoff yet, Mike? Uh, I have seen the new kickoff. Uh, it looks like you guys have seen in like the UFL or whatever all these spring leagues that I don't watch are called. Um, my thing is though, they seem to be using, so their returners that they're experimenting with are Chenault, Eskridge is back there. Trey Brown's back there as well. Those are probably the three that I would guess would be in, in the running there. Um, but it's it's weird to me that – so, Chris, you know, they're right there. They're like five yards away from each other or something. Yep. And they're still using small guys like DBs and like tight ends. It's, the tight ends aren't that small. Could it be that they're not trying to show their hand? Obviously, it's not, it's not as if people are going to see the film of this, so it's not – not yeah, but to say special teams isn't recorded, I don't think, at practice. So I don't – I would use linemen. Maybe I'm no, just that's, overthinking no, it. No, that's exactly what I said. I would put DK out there. I would put Charles Cross. And I would draw up certain plays to have dudes hit holes for touchdowns. That's the easiest way to draw this up. Have a, have a counter on a kickoff. Because as you mentioned, it's five yards apart. You get one guy pulling, one guy – you can do so much with it. Obviously, I'm not going to try to explain it all, but there is a lot that you can do by putting your best run blockers out there and trying to get some points, get a quick buck, get a quick bang for your buck in the first 14 seconds of the game or when there's a kickoff. Yeah, I, 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 prob- I wouldn't put so here's the here's the here's maybe what they're thinking is I wouldn't put my best lineman out there because I would. it's just not that valuable to risk potentially losing like Charles. Like in that in that scenario, but like, there's no linemen out there, and I just think that's a bad. Like I I put my backups out there, maybe you know I don't know, but you only get to dress I think eight linemen, so maybe that that's probably it. Now I'm talking myself through it. That's probably the issue is you just have more bodies to spare at other spots. That's that's probably the answer now that I really think about it. But I feel like if you really wanted to maximize it though, yes, you would put your linemen out because essentially you just created a line of scrimmage. That's what the new kickoff row has become. So it's just like, why would I treat that line of scrimmage any different than the line of scrimmage during any other time in the game? Because so this – the Seahawks – yeah. Sorry. I, I, don't know who, I don't know who's doing it. I don't know how the teams are doing it. We'll see. I, I just think that – yes, I have seen it. I've thought about it, as you can tell. It's a, my thoughts are <laughs> a work in progress because I need to actually see it in a game. I feel like the Hall of Fame game is this week. Right? It is. Thursday. It's Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I, I, that's – it's like the one time that I'm going to watch it two teams that aren't the Seahawks and like really look at the special teams. Uh, <laughs> now, I just want to, I just want to see, cause right now my initial, it. my initial thought is play your best blockers because you've created a line of scrimmage where blocking is of the utmost importance now, you know, whereas before it was like, well, it's not as important. It's blocking still important, but there's running involved too. Like there's so much space, you know, but now it's just like, we're all right here on the line. So I could put the fat guys out there. Because if the if my returner just clears the line, he's gone, in theory. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just that we don't have the bodies to spare to do that, which is perfectly fine. Linemen are too valuable to potentially risk on a kickoff. Like imagine the Niners try some stupid stuff like that. You put Trent Williams out there, he gets hurt. You're like, well, that was stupid. You know what I mean? Like that's I I, I understand. You know, but I I still I, I just want to see it because it doesn't make they had like Marquise Blair out there. I think blocking. I'm just like, well, why is he on the? You know what I'm saying? Like that just doesn't. He's like 190 pounds or something, you know what I mean? But so, <laughs> but then on the, and I, I would also put my pass rushers out there too, though. You know, my guys who can get off of blocks. You know, I put all my backup linebackers on the coverage team for sure. You know, it, I don't know. I, I, I'm look, I'm viewing it more as a line of scrimmage thing. Maybe, maybe I'm just not. This is showing why I'm not a special teams coordinator. Who knows? Uh, the other part of that question was, oh, relationships. It's still really early, though. The one thing that's been kind of funny and. We're not really supposed to report what we hear, but I, this this one I will share. 
It's like D line guys making fun of the uh, of the British dude's accent, the British coach's yeah, accent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's funny. Really, cool, because the because he's like dirty kind of line guy, you know. Yeah, Aiden Dirt Dirty. Uh, he he works for the D line, which is like mostly like southern country guys, largely. You know, like they're not all like from the south, but you can get my point, right? It's like if if you know Daryl Taylor, I think is from like uh, I forget where he's from, but. Like he's not from nowhere close to London. So him like trying to do like the coach's accent, like kind of funny, you know, as an example, I don't know if he's done it. I just feel like they all just poke fun at him uh, with how he sounds. Cause it does, it just sounds so different than the other coaches, right? Everybody else is like, yeah, bags here, blah, blah. You just, you're used to it. And it's like, all right, y'all, you're going to go around the dummy. And it's like, oh my goodness, what? <laughs> what did you Coach, say? You that? And then there's a little baby song right now. It's like a drill song with a UK rapper. I don't know who the rapper is, but they play this song in practice quite a bit. So then that makes them think, start thinking about London and stuff like that. It's just kind of funny, like in terms of just relationship building, because it's all in good fun. But when when I read this question, that's the first thing that popped up, because that is just kind of how you just build. You know, you get to know guys. Y'all all got friends. You know, some friends you make fun of, jokes. You know, that isn't malicious, but that's an example that I've that I've kind of peeped. Uh, that's been. Uh, Pretty, pretty funny. Uh, all of the all of the guys in their draft classes, I kind of overestimate how sometimes that re- important that relationship is. Like, even if guys aren't on the same side of the ball, um, like you get someone like Spoon and Jackson, right? Opposite sides of the ball, but they're in the same draft class, so they like this. You know what I mean? You see a lot of like draft class relationships that I just, I forget that that's like even, like that's how some of these guys become best friends too. It's just like, hey, we just went through rookie year together, and then it grows from there. Like I was watching Zach Charbonnet, like Mike Morris, like just joke with each other. And I'm like, oh yeah, they're they're rookies together. I forgot about that. Like otherwise, I was like, did they play together? No. Um. So or did they play? They might have played together. Um. I can't remember. I know Zach transferred somewhere, but you guys get the point. So those are some examples that I've seen of some relationships. Draft class, they're making fun of the British coach. Very funny. <laughs> this is from Phil Burnbaum. Has Olu's play in camp been suspect enough to where signing Connor Williams would make him the instant starter at center? Oh, also, yeah, Zach Sharpen, they played at Michigan. Oh, maybe that's how they're, they're close. That might not be a draft class thing. I'm sorry. I don't know if they overlap, no, but anyway. Uh, Connor Williams. No, nah, man, I, I actually think. The Connor Williams thing, I don't know why people are making that about Olu. If anything, I feel like that's about uh, the other backup center, uh, the Husky. What is that guy? Nick oh, Harris. Oh, um, yeah, I think his name is yes. Nick Harris. Yes. yes. He played for Cleveland last season. That's right. Yeah. Yes. I view that more as about him because I don't think you just guarantee in Connor. Connor, he's like fine. I don't think he's like, all right, I'm going to just guarantee you this starting job of coming off of ACL and a scheme you never played in. Yeah, I'm not like that. I just don't view him that way. And I don't think the coaches view him that way either. They would have signed him. So um, I think he's going to get like a non-guaranteed type of deal probably coming off the bad leg and stuff. So, no, I I think uh, I I don't don't view it as an indictment of Olu at all. I think Olu's – I think he's going to be okay. He's going to be – he's one of those guys I feel like is just going to get better. I think we talked about him before too, like on a different – show where it was just like i could see him maybe he's not great in september but like november it's like okay cool the seahawks finally have a center i could see a situation like that where he just the reps do him so good i could just i could just see that uh because he's just such a smart guy when you talk to him you watch him and you watch him with people who actually know what old linemen are doing when they're doing all that pointing and then you're like oh okay that's what all that means because you see it i've had to ask guys like yo what okay he's pointing at this he means this okay cool you know so uh yeah, if they do sign Connor, which I imagine they, they might, uh, I think it's really more about like Nick Harris than it would be about Olu. All right. This next one is from Tyler Cockerill. Early prediction. Who will be the camp preseason standout that won't make the 53 man roster? Man, this hurts. This hurts. Because unfortunately, it might end up being my guy. You know, we're coots. I'm biased. I think Aesop should be on the team, but it's good. It's it's tough with the way the roster looks right now. You basically got three spots that are locks. After that, I think they keep five receivers. So you like you got like Derek, Jake, D, 
and Aesop. I would say roughly those four guys competing for two spots. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. I feel like one of those guys, I won't say it's Aesop per se, but I think it's going to be probably one of the two of those guys or something like that. I could easily see Aesop leading the team in receiving yards in the preseason. He might have this actually this last year. I think he went off in that Green Bay game because I'm t- like, he can ball. And I would probably give him the nod because he should be their punt returner because you know, they don't have a punt returner right now, you know, because uh, they lost DJ Dallas. So I think Aesop should be the punt returner. So maybe he maybe he sneaks on for that reason. And then it's someone like Bobo or Derek that is ends up uh, left off. So I, I would probably say one of those guys, it's, that's probably going to be it. And it's not because those guys didn't play well. Just the numbers make it a little funky. I think in particular what's going to make it funky, they might have to keep 11 D linemen because mm. if they're making – because usually they would keep four outside backers. But if you if you guarantee Draymond, Draymond Jones a spot, that's five, and you have to keep six defensive tackles. So you have to keep at least two nose tackles, and then you got to keep at least four – like three techs or whatever, you know, so that's Byron. You got to keep Byron. You got to keep Jerry. Reed, you got to keep Leo. You got to keep Jonathan Hankins. That's four right there. You're probably not going to cut Mike Morris already. He's a draft pick. You're probably not going to cut Cam Young either. You know, that's six right there. You know, you got Miles Adams too. I guess you could cut Miles if you want. So anyway, my guess would be, yeah, I one of the receivers. I can see one of the receivers balling and the numbers just not working out. All right. Well, our last one, it comes from Slim at Ziggy Not Nice. I'm not going to lie. This has nothing to do with camp, but the homies and I got into a heated argument. <laughs> Who is the best Seahawks running back of all time, Sean Alexander or Marshawn Lynch? Who do you have? Man, this was tough. I was going back and forth, and I will say, Mar- or excuse me, Sean Alexander. I, I won't look past the fact that I know he was more finesse. He still got the job done. He was still an MVP. He rushed for, I think, 27 touchdowns, trying to try to chase after LaDainian Tomlinson, who had, I think, 30. Yeah, he rushed for 27 in, in 05, the MVP year. That's, I need mean, no discredit to Marshawn, because Marshawn, he, there are moments in time where Marshawn just changed Seahawks as a culture, right? But if we're just talking about on-field product, I don't feel is it's a diss to Marshawn. He's a legend in this town. But if I had to pick one, I would have to go with Sean Alexander. And I know that might rub some 12s the wrong way, and I'm sorry for that. Because I know you're... Oh, he's no, you're not. Cri- I am. I'm very sorry. But I'm rolling with with, with, with Sean Alexander. He he just... I mean, the, the rock and the baby in the end zone, that's just iconic as well. It's not a... He didn't have the beast quake or anything, but <laughs> Sean Alexander was really nasty. I mean, my man was on the cover of Madden. That's how elite he was. So... I'm I think gonna go with I mean, Sean. Marshawn probably should have been on there at least once. He um, should have. No, yeah, that's it's. I I just say that point because Madden's coming out soon. So here, whatever. Next, go ahead, Mike. Can't believe you guys still play Madden and complain about it every year. It's just what? Fascinating. fascinating. I know it's it's really bad. We could do a whole pot on that, Mike. I don't know how we're gonna structure the Seahawks way, but anywho, Mike, who are you rolling with? Who do you who you got? Or you so, know what? You might even go further back and say Kurt Warner. I know a lot of older Seahawk listeners, Seahawk fans, excuse me. No, it's not. It's, not. It's, 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 either, it's either Sean or Marshawn. Or it's either, yeah, hey, man, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just saying there might be someone that's 50 years old and said, Chris, Mike, have you ever seen Kurt Warner? Not the quarterback. I'm just saying. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, you know, old people love their people who they watch live and they're in, you know, in their young days. Mike said they that. Over, I did not. They, they overvalue them or whatever. You know, it's, 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 it's fine, you know. Um, <laughs> Just we just gotta we just gotta realize these new dudes are just built different, you know. You know I don't, <laughs> they really they really are. Anyway, uh, this was actually tougher than I thought. Like when I read yeah. the question, I was like, "Oh, this is easily Sean Alexander." No, it's not uh, easy. <laughs> well, because that five year little stretch there, Sean Alexander had is just unbelievable. It was like it was like a guaranteed to get like eleven hundred yards and like thirteen every touchdowns year. or whatever. Yeah. Like every year, yeah. it was just like you could just pencil it in. I was like, "Oh my god, that's nuts," you know. Uh, this is yeah. So and they were both the engine of they were like like the killers on teams that went to the Super Bowl, you know, uh 
Marshawn's team won it, but it's not like they won the Super Bowl because they had Marshawn, right? Like, Den- Denver just wasn't ready. You know, you could have been the running back and they would have beaten the Broncos by 30. The Broncos just were just awful that day. At every phase of football, they sucked. It was unbelievable. <laughs> I've never seen anything like that in the Super Bowl, uh, which is awful. So I think it's a lot closer than I thought. I think I'm still lean with, with Sean uh, Alexander. Uh, I realized I, I know I, every time I said Sean, I was thinking Marshawn, but I was like, no, I'm thinking Sean Alexander. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Marshawn's little stretch too, you know, he was probably just as good. The yardage was not exactly the same, but it was pretty close. I mean, from 2011 to 2014, he had at least 1200 yards on the ground and mm-hmm. at least 11 touchdowns for four straight seasons. And he was all pro pro bowler four years in a row. He's on the, all decade team for the 2010s. I think Sean Alexander is on the 20 to the 2000s all decade team. So it's it's pretty close. I, I give the slight nod uh, to Sean Alexander. I just think his peak was probably a little better, uh, but it's it's really close. Like Marshawn is just a a monster too. But yeah, I probably I probably lean towards Sean. It's an interesting question. Like I can see how that led to a heated debate because you think oh, about yeah. it and you go back and look at the numbers and you're like, wait. Sean Alexander ran for like 1,800 yards before? And you're just Bruh. like, yes, man. Almost ran for 2K. Cool. <laughs> yeah, and it's just like, it, the more I thought about Marshawn as a catcher, too, I was like, huh, that's an underrated part of his game a little bit. Like, you know, one year he led the Seahawks in receiving touchdowns? Yeah. I, I forgot yeah. about that, 2014. But he only had like four, which is like crazy. But, yeah, that I forgot about that. Uh, yeah, he's yeah, it's close. I don't think there's a wrong answer, though, to be fair. I just would lean towards Sean Alexander. Uh, but I don't think you can go wrong with make, making a, a pick here because that, that all decade team is hard to get on. It's something I cite quite a bit when I, I try to compare people because not to say that list is the end all be all, but it's tough to make those, you know, no, you uh, got to be a beast. You got to be a beast for a long time. You Man, know, it's for, a decade you know, list. It's not least, a... <laughs> well, you, at least half the decade. You know, that's what my I mean? point. Like, you got to dominate at least half those years to be even considered. And then looking at the stats, what, yeah, Sean Alexander, it, it, as I mentioned, it's, it's close and it was tough for me to say this, but I I'd have to pick Sean. I know the physicality of Marshawn that trumps anything Sean does. Cause he, he was finesse. He wasn't about to, he, he stepped out of bounds. He made business decisions. All right. Yeah, he yeah, saw right. a linebacker and, Oh, I'm gonna get the first down, but let me just go and scoot out of bounds. Marshawn did the exact opposite. Marshawn saw the first down, went and got it, and then saw a linebacker and said, I'm going to run you over, and then laughed at you afterwards. <laughs> What's up, bro? That was a weak-ass tackle. You know, like, that's Marshawn. That's his persona. He's about that action, boss. And, Mar- yeah, and Sean Alexander is, yeah, I'll, I'm going to collect this check, get in this end zone, rock the baby. My knees are good. I'm healthy. It's been a great run, guys. Appreciate you. Thank you. I will I will say, if you guys are going to have arguments about this, I would not knock sean for having a better o-line because i can already see that happening in the argument it's like well he had hutch he had walter jones of course he put up those numbers it's like i don't like penalizing people for having good teammates right like what did you do in the situation you're in marshawn's o-line some of them sucked some of them were good none of them were as good as that old five team i was hoping you wouldn't bring that up mike because now the comments just now people do that though you do you see that a lot of like mvp debates too it's like well he has such and such around him it's like well is that's not his fault i'm not gonna penalize the guy for having good teammates right like just i'm not gonna reward someone for having bad teammates i just don't think that's really we can we have so much more information it's just tough to judge players than that so that's that's uh that's kind of how i view it. but it's it is very close i will say to speak to marshawn's craziness uh at one time sydney sydney rice told me a story that marshawn he didn't like Dante Whitner. I think they played oh, together boy. in Buffalo. That's it. Yeah, they played together in Buffalo, and they obviously they were in the NFC West at the same time. He with the Niners, Marshawn. Niners. Mm-hmm. And he would tell Sydney, he would tell all the receivers this. He would tell them, like, hey, don't block number 31 or whatever Dante's number. Like, <laughs> don't block him because I just want to run him over. And if you block him, I'm going to be mad at you. And they'd be like, well, it's my job to get the safety on this. On this play, and he'd be like, I don't care what your job is. I told you not to block him. Don't block him. I just want him to I want him to come clean at me so I can run his ass over. And the guys would listen. He said Marshawn would tell him. He said they would tell him, hey, don't block, don't block that dude. Like that's that's insane. That's like that's that's nuts. 
it's, it's, I have a bunch of favorite Marshawn stories, but that's becoming one of them because it's just so crazy because Dante Whitner was a hitter. And Marshawn Dante was just like, I don't care. I want <laughs> free up. Yeah, come on. Let him through. You know, and I will lay him out every time. Yeah, they played in Buffalo together. So, uh, yeah, that was a fun Marshawn story to close the show. To take a page out of Mike's book in regards to his movie references, I got one for you. Remember the Titans? I forget who said it, but I think it was Bertier that said, let him through. Who, what, they were practicing, and he said, let him through on this play. And he jumped. Yeah, it was, uh, no, it was, the, it was the quarterback, Sunshine. That's what it was, Sunshine. He told, he told, he told Bro to let the blocker through so he could <laughs> upend him. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah, I can see Marshawn like, let him through. Yep, and he's like, what? Let him through. Okay. <laughs> Imagine it in Marshawn voice, though, with a bunch of profanity that we can't even use on the show, right? But I don't yeah. even care, bro. Let homie through. I'm going to run his ass Yeah, over. exactly Promise like me. that. Yes. Oh, my yes, mama. Yes. Yes. I don't care what your job is, bro. Let him through. Yeah. Bro, no, that, that, that's your Marshawn. job right now, let him through, because that's what, hey, <laughs> if you don't let him through, I'm going to come at your ass, bro. That's 1, definitely Marshawn. <laughs> let blood through. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> now nah, let blood let blood come through the hole, cuz. <laughs> oh man, no, you're right. It's uh, just like that. Yeah. Oh, I, I love that. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I'm glad that we got that question. That I I have no had no other reason to tell that Marshawn story. I've been sitting on it for a while now. It's just perfect time to let that go. Perfect time. Well, look, we've been on this for some time, so we appreciate you guys for tapping in and listening to another CX or watching. And watching Seahawks Man to Man podcast. We appreciate all the love and support. It's go time. We're back at it. Training camp is a week in. I guess technically four days, not really a week, but you get my point. Another week coming up. Preseason games are getting ready to start. Mike is feverishly writing every day now. So we appreciate all the love and support. We'll come back to you again. Maybe this week, if not for sure, next week. Mike, is there anything you want to add before we get out of here? I appreciate the love and support. Uh, again, if y'all see us at camp, say what up. I know there's a ton of y'all there, but you know, if you see us, come on down, say what up. You know, love seeing you guys in person, here from you, kind of feeling the love. Otherwise, thank you. Hit subscribe on YouTube, hit subscribe everywhere, really. Um, and we'll catch you guys next time. Peace. <laughs>